little sort of um, station clock on the wall. Uh, so if we want to uh, uh, have a right time departure, if I can uh, uh, welcome you all this afternoon to today's Mosey Travel Committee meeting. Uh, in terms of apologies for absence, we've got Councillors Ron Abbey and Councillor Patrick Kindley, Councillor Terry Shields, and just Councillor Les Rollins. Apologise for the absence. Yes. Uh, apart from that, I think we've got a full house. Um, it's probably also a suitable opportunity just to um, give a very, very warm welcome to Councillor Joe Lilly, who is the new member from Knowsley Council. Yeah. Really looking forward to, to working closely with the uh, Joe and sort of very much welcome to the good ship from Mersey Travel. Um, the second um, item is declarations of interest. That just falls for me to remind everyone accordingly and Jeremy. Which I just mentioned, uh, item number eight is a member of the Liverpool Airport Consultative Committee and Noise Monitoring Committee on behalf of the Pussy Council. Thanks for that. Any further? No? Okay. Um, third item of business is the appointment of Deputy Chair and now nominate Councillor Gordon Friel. That's seconded. I second that too. Is that agreed? Congratulations, Gordon. We're looking you. forward to working with you in the new position. Well done. Okay, uh, before we move on, it's a suitable opportunity just to um, make, um, I think, a couple of very positive announcements, as I'm sure everyone uh, linked with the organisation will be fully aware. Within the past month, we've had the National Transport Awards, and it really was a sort of uh, good evening and celebration for Mersey Travel because. First and foremost, we were awarded um, Integrated Transport Authority of the Year, and that really is to sort of congratulate everyone uh, linked with Mersey Travel, members, offices, and wider stakeholders, um, our colleagues in the districts and operators and so forth, really kind of um, achieving that achievement and, and being recognised for it. So really, really well done from myself to everyone uh, who's involved in that. But secondarily, we also received the award for Ferries Operator uh, of the Years. Now, we've always known that our ferry um, service is the best in the country, without a doubt, but it is great that that's actually been acknowledged by uh, national awards in the way that we have done. We have got uh, a group of, uh, of uh, members from the Ferries team here, uh, and from our perspective, it really is our opportunity as members to say, Really, really well done on achieving that. We know kind of all the hard work that you as a team have been putting in for years, and particularly in recent times, some of the kind of stuff you've been doing to continue the success of Mersey Ferries. So thank you ever so much uh, from us, and I think it's appropriate for that award and the previous award if we just sort of put our hands together as a show of thanks and celebration. <laughs> to add that good news and if we can, can move on um, accordingly. The next item of business is the minutes of uh, the last meeting. Um, can I move that those are um, a correct record of the meeting that we had on the 1st of October? Excellent. I shall sign those accordingly. The next item is um, item 5, the General Purposes Subcommittee. Um, and that's for me to move the proceedings of the committee that was held on the 15th of October, if that's agreed. Yeah. Excellent. Item number six, Ken. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Can I move the proceedings of the proposal to the new subcommittee held on the 19th of October 2015? If that's agreed. Agreed. Excellent. And moving on to item number seven, that's the Smart Ticketing Programme of for October 2015. <coughs> and Gary's going to be.
obviously during that time, between November and early this year, uh, the product was limited to just the walls, uh, just to the, uh, the middle area. Uh, moving on from that, uh, just to bring to members' attention the 4.3.2, the smart solo uh, that we introduced brings the concept of a ticket that is uh, non dated and then is activated on the first time that it's used. Uh, we are aware that this introduced uh, some issues, some technical issues from drivers in using their ticket machines, and uh, the speed submits and similar tickets have not been accepted or validated. Most travel are working actively with the operators involved to resolve any issues, and uh, we think we're getting some good traction on that now. Uh, 4.3.3, just to point out, this project is now entering the final phase, and uh, we just make sure that the operational procedures are embedded and there for the future, and after that, the project activities will start to close down. And um, any other new uh, products that are looking to migrate onto the Porsche platform will be managed uh, in this program but by creating a new project, i.e. Project 4, 5, 6, and so on. Therefore, the uh, Project 2 is uh, remaining as we for this period. Finally, uh, Project 3, uh, so I think, as you know from previous reports, we're continuing, continuing to work on our two modeling exercises. Uh, alongside this, we're working with uh, colleagues on the Bus Alliance project, and we're looking at how the Bush platform can be further leveraged to provide a common platform across the Alliance, regardless of the operator. We are considering a number of options uh, on the 4.4.3, and we have a number of cross-organisation working groups that have been taking place and continue to do so. And they're looking at the feasibility for each of the options and consideration, and we're looking at things in there, such as commercials, uh, financials, uh, and operational factors as well. Um, <clears throat> some of those options that we're considering include a solo ticket, a uh, day version, which can be sold as a common eight or the bundle of tickets, the amount of technical phrase. Um, we're also looking at a young person's four weekly solo, which is a, a gap in the solo, solo product, so that we don't currently but we're also working with operators looking at operator only tickets, such as the Arena Weekly, and we're looking at whether that could be sold on the Wars card in the near future. We've also had several meetings with uh, Mercy Travel and Mercy Rail, looking at also uh, what potential products they could uh, migrate onto the Wars platform. And most likely candidates include the weekly and four weekly rail pass, and the move of the remaining saveways that are still issued on the um, orange rail type ticket. Smart Ticketing team, uh, they've been working closely, uh, myself in particular, with the Transport for the North group uh, under the Integrated and Smart Ticketing work stream. With that, we're looking to assist with the development of that TFM work, as well as identifying any synergies with Mercy Travel's plans and looking for opportunities for joint working in the future. And uh, more information will follow when that's uh, appropriate. The results of all these investigations and feasibility studies will be that we will be able to develop a smart ticketing program um, with clearly defined projects being added to the program as I've discussed already. And it is the intention of the program group to uh, present to you the overview of that, uh, that plan before the end of 2050. So project three is uh, still marked as we as continuing uh, progress is, is there. Under 4.5, something I wanted to bring to your attention on this report, and uh, just sort of make you aware for the future, is around the Wars card distribution. Since we launched the Wars platform, we have been looking with uh, we've had higher than expected card retention rates. Typically they are 65 to 70 percent of sales on a daily basis on our previously launched card. I think that's come about because uh, we've been really promoting the fact that big people are getting their card free at the point of purchasing the ticket, uh, but that will last forever, so look after it and keep it safe. And that, that sort of message has gone out to the public, which is great. Um, so we've been able to extend the introductory offer of offering a free board card, uh, which was requested by you, the members. And um, despite that high retention rate, however, we're still issuing around 5,000 new cards each week. So although that's still within our initial expected projections, that obviously cannot continue. 
each card has a physical production cost, which is the, the plastic card, the printing, and the shipping. But it also has a, a digital cost, and without going into depth about the social standards, it has something called a shell, so we have to pay for that electronic version of the card as well. So it's therefore prudent that uh, the tension and reuse of the Lord's card is promoted to members of the public. The Smart Ticketing team is currently considering options around how we might do this, and we'll be bringing that to you in the future. Um, and that is the Excellent. Thanks, Gary. Members, well, any questions or comments? Mark? Jack? Thanks, Jack. Shared best practice because obviously Manchester have tried cars and <coughs> failed. It hasn't been successful as yours. Um, 
program called Smart Cities, or Smart Cities Partnership, to give it a school title. So that's looking at some lessons learned from across the country, uh, sharing those with all the different participants. Um, the, the TF homework is very much more focused on transport from left to right across across that corridor, from left to right technology. Um, so there are, there are obviously, in the course of conversations, lessons being learned and things being discussed. How do we leverage what's already there in all the individual cities with the, the, the transport for the world? Again, there's two, two different things, but yes, it's all, it's all being discussed regularly. That's, that's great, thanks for that, Gary. Just from my own perspective as well, just to sort of say thank you for the, the continued progress. I've been really looking forward to seeing how smart solar continues to progress. But also hearing about how potentially some of the operators' products will start coming onto walls, and by the same extension, start getting onto the rail network by Mersey Rail. So it's really good progress. We've got a lot more to do, but you know, really pleased with how it's going. Look forward to hearing about more of that progress in the future. <coughs> so if I can then move uh, the recommendation to paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. Item number eight is. Um, Mersey Travels Rich Commission to the Transport Select Committee inquiry into service transport to airports from Suzanne to the Chair. Essentially, as, as um, Chair pointed out, this is Mersey Travels written submission to the Transport Select Committee's inquiry into service transport to airports. This is being brought to you retrospectively due to the type, time scales for submission. The inquiry was only launched on the 11th of September, and so there was clearly insufficient time for us to seek formal approval on the response before we had to submit it on the 12th of October. But the response was approved by both the Chair and the Director of Integrated Transport Services before we submitted it. Effectively, the committee are looking at strategic connections to airports and whether or not they fulfil current and future requirements in terms of sort of the range of capacity. And it'll also help sort of the effectiveness in terms of the government's approach to planning surface access as well. And they really wanted to get a good feel for what surface access is like at the regional airports, what the users feel like, where the gaps are, where the problems are, how well it's working and such like. And so we're really looking for a whole range of, of, of answers, whatever evidence we've got, sort of to, to, to give them some, something to work with. We based our response on some baseline research that we undertook initially in 2014 to really sort of look at what surface access was like to John Lennon Airport, look at where the problems were there, look at how well that was received, look at where the gaps were. And from that, we're now doing a subsequent piece of work to try and sort of build on that and, and improve where the areas were. We, we felt that there were improvements needed, things like the fact that the 500 bus only comes into Liverpool 1 and doesn't go up to Lime Street anymore. So really, little things like that we were identified through the base phase one work, we're now looking to take forward through phase two. So the response that we submitted was largely based around that research and really giving some good clear numbers as to the kind of levels of service access that currently exist, where we think we can improve, how we're going to improve, how we're working with the airport, what the role is of the bus operators and these service providers are as well. So to try and give them as much information from our perspective um, to really sort of help them look at ways that they can work with the government to ensure the government really have it clued up as well. We have made direct reference to our passenger duty within that as well. Not so much from the perspective that we see that there are any short solutions, short term solutions to the issue, but we did think it was worthwhile pointing out that in the last round of sort of government announcements, the Chancellor had announced that vehicle excise duty was going to be ring-fenced for road surface improvements, and we felt it was worth putting down a marker that a similar exercise whereby a passenger duty could be ring-fenced for surface access works as well, that we thought that was worth throwing in there as well. But as I say, our response is put there for your information. We did share it with the airport, and I have got a copy of the airport's response as well. They are very broadly in line, and we are very closely working with them to try and make sure that surface access is as smooth and as straightforward as possible for anybody accessing the airport. Um, before I invite um, members to make any questions, to ask any questions or make any comments, I'm just going to quickly just mention about the time scales. Um, yes, I appreciate the tight time scales, but we should always seek to bring these to a committee uh, to make sure that we signed off appropriately. Because whilst I don't disagree with anything in the, the report, don't get me wrong, um, we do need to go through the 
all the processes and actually um, in paragraph one the last sentence isn't right because I haven't seen that. Now I suppose we'll let that's ever happened, I'm sure it won't be repeated, but let's just make sure we get it right in, in the future. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, and that's it. Thanks, Chair. You know, I fully endorse your comments on that because it has been brought to this chamber on more than one occasion that we, the elected members, need to see the papers before the presenters. Are, you know, we have said on many occasions we don't want table papers, we want uh, a full view of them. Uh, but leaving that aside, I mean, this really reinforces and backs up our bit for the High Speed 2 uh, and other links in the area, and of course it links up again with the, 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 the Northern Powerhouse uh, for transport accessibility. I mean, Liverpool Airport in the past was held up because it was declared by the War Office that it was a necessary uh, War Department drop-off point from America to there so we could go to Burton and Wood. And so we were started in Liverpool, uh, we were the biggest airport at the time, and Manchester then took up that mantle and that's not where Manchester is. That's purely on government many years ago. But you know, Liverpool Airport, John Lennon Airport, is the least effective airport in the country by weather. And if we get the good transport, such so service links, high speed too, you know, just over now to London, what's to stop us using that? And also we've we'll got the Halton Care into the North Wales, the Welsh office. So it strengthens our bid as a centre of communication and centre of excellence with the ferries cruise terminals uh, and the airport, so uh, let's hope the government read more into it than what's actually there. And also, we'll have sent our hand in future when we present our case. Uh, good report, thanks very much, sir. Thanks, Ken. Tony and then John. We'd always sort of welcome to sort of the, the opportunity to try and look to it improve sort of direct links to the airport. We've known for some time, as, 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 as been highlighted by Councillor Flashing, that it, it, it is an airport that sort of is a chunk away from the, the strategic rail network and the strategic transport network. Obviously, sort of work that we've been doing through projects like the Holton Curve are trying to sort of to address that. But the, the, the issues that we've seen in taking the project as simple as the Holton Curve forward have demonstrated how hard it is to take big capital schemes forward. But yes, I do take on board Councillor Carl's point that you, yeah, you have to start somewhere. John. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for this uh, for the report. Um, just correct me if I'm wrong, I just want to get this might that maybe we have the scope of what you were uh, asked to do for the report. But there seems to me that it requires here some sort of addressing the issue to do with uh, real time information and some sort of synergy between the multi modal points. So, for example, when somebody lands at Liverpool Airport, they then know, for example, exactly how they can get to the next destination by, uh, say, an app or just like that, there's a toll app or something like that. Or real time information actually itself within the airport. And I'm just wondering. Certainly not sort of outside the scope per se. In terms of the, the actual call for, 
for evidence, the only things that were, were barred on that were not interested in was non-surface access of modes to transport, so basically domestic flights and air quality issues in relation to airports as well. So certainly all of the things in relation to information provision and such like were definitely sort of were, were up for fair game. I think that's certainly something that's come out through the, the research that we've done in terms of, as you say, keeping people informed. If you want to encourage people to make multimodal journeys, they do need to be directed to where the buses are, to how to access the train network, to know when those journeys are arriving. So those are the sorts of issues that we are looking to sort of try and develop. And that's what we're starting to find through the, the, the phase two part of the research is really highlighting the routes that we need to go down to improve that kind of information. Okay, any further questions or comments? If not, can I move the recommendation in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed? Excellent. And answer number nine is the response to deficit consultation on draft plans to improve air quality. So you have response. Thank you, Chair. Now, I can take briefly through the report, but I have got um, colleagues with me who are much greater experts in air quality than I am. So if you have got any technical questions, then I have got people on hand to, to be able to help us in that context. Essentially, again, this is a, a, a response to government consultation, this time being run through DEFRA. And they're looking at getting some kind of feedback on their draft plans to improve air quality. Now this has largely come about on the back of our, ours as a nation's failure to meet the European Directive on Ambient Air Quality and Cleaner Air. And that basically sets out maximum concentrations of key pollutants in the ambient air, i.e. the air that we breathe. Now because the European Commission have, have highlighted to the UK government that there are various issues, um, the UK government have in turn sort of turned back to look at the action plans that they already had in place, to look at how they are tackling nitrogen dioxide across our towns and cities. There are 38 areas across the UK that are currently, whilst on target to meet the levels by 2020, are currently failing in certain areas. So the air quality plans that are being consulted upon are the ones that are centred on those areas there. And a specific interest are the ones for the Liverpool urban area and the Birkenhead urban area as well. The reason that Motor Travel chose to submit a response to this, whilst not being a, a, an authority that would necessarily directly affect air quality, is simply because throughout all of the documentation, throughout all of the action plans and the overview document, transport habitually highlighted as a, as, a, as a key contributor to air quality issues. So we, we thought it right to sort of try and sort of say from our perspective what we as an organisation are trying to do to improve the, the air quality across the Liverpool City region. Obviously working in, co in cooperation with the local authorities as well. Um, I think you will notice from the response it, it, it is actually a, a little strangely laid out in places and I will just highlight it. It's an online response. So where I sort of put the, the actual response in, it's based on the responses that were available. And equally, because in a lot of government consultations, we're allowed to be a little freer with our response and write a generic response. With this one, we very much had to tailor our answers to the questions that were given. Um, notwithstanding, we thought it appropriate that we should sort of set out, certainly say within question two, where we knew of actions that were happening across the city region that MERS Travel were leading on that could improve air quality and weren't necessarily reflected in the action plans. So we've highlighted a lot of those initiatives there. It's worth pointing out that within those action plans, much of the information within them is lifted from the air quality management area process. And because they're sort of strange beasts in terms of the fact that they are in quite specific areas, that's why some of the activities within the air quality action plans are a little bit sort of strange, are very, very narrow and focused on strange areas. For example, the Birkenhead urban area action plan doesn't actually have any actions in for the whole of the world, just down in the Ellesmere port area, simply because that's the only place that there are any air quality, action, air quality management areas on the world itself. So those are the sorts of things that we highlighted within that report. We just sort of thought that the government seemed to be taking almost an easy way out by saying, look, we've got air quality action plans in place, putting the onus on to the local authorities to try and improve air quality, when fundamentally the problem is, is, is much more sort of back from that. The government have got to put resources in the right place, have got to basically support local authorities improving air quality, and it doesn't sort of boil down to the least common denominator, i.e. The, uh, the air quality monitoring officer within each of the local authorities. 
We have highlighted resources as a specific issue within our response to question five, and I will thank Councillor Howard for pointing out a small error within there where down to our changing of the text we've, we've referred to due to the lack of the severe constraints on resources. Obviously, that's a bit of the tautology there, and I've taken out the lack of and left in the severe constraints. It's a better way of expressing that we do feel that not enough energy, not enough effort, there isn't simply enough money to target on air quality when the government's forcing their austerity measures on local authorities. So there's a lot of information to digest in there, but fundamentally we thought it was right that we put a market down to say that we as a transport authority, we're doing our bit. Here, here. <laughs> you, you've said it all there, I shut down and I won't contradict or disagree with any of it. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Go on. Then I'll... Okay. It's just a, uh, I don't have any problems at the, uh, the report at the beginning, I think it is good. Uh, I'd just like to mention on page 18, we talked about ourselves as an organisation doing a reduction of 13% in our uh, energy consumption. And obviously what's been commented on about the fines in 2020, if government doesn't ensure that it reaches the European targets. Uh, I, I have a great deal of uh, concerns in this, in, in this area because the board that I represent has got two the air quality management areas in it. One of, one of those runs down the uh, bridge area and the, and the other one is Princess Way. And both have had exceedances in the in the limits. We'll, we'll play the game really where in terms of air quality, it's the government that's laying down what we can measure and how we measure it to be of any importance. But I think the real issues that are coming out for me are the fact that in Vin Diesel we have the very, very small particular patterns to describe uh, is the order. And the latest green diesel, the the microns are even smaller than that. And if those that penetrate deep into people's bodies, it's going to be a uh, health impact. And I just think we're blinded on the one side is that we only look at one thing because the government's uh, laid it down on us to do that. But I think wider than that, I think transport will play a major area in, in how to reduce all of those uh, particular matters. In regard to the, the actual implies itself, very pleased at some of the points that we raised there because I think for too long one that's been uh, been omitted is the fact that we do have marine vessels that contribute to that. Uh, there is also the fact that on non-transport sources, uh, the chair is probably aware of this, uh, we, we do get uh, an amount of uh, pollution that comes from Europe across all the different um, manufacturing processes and grants and, and those countries. I think is uh, if we can look to the to, to the future and we can make any 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 comment to government is I think some of the core advisors when it becomes the fact is that we're not measuring all the things that detract from our air quality. We're, we're only being told to measure that. But I think there's things and it's not this isn't for our officers really to, to be doing the work outside of what the uh, what the challenge is by the government. But I think we're missing a big picture on that one chair. I'd just I'd just like our team. Remark was given to raise more detailed points, and that's absolutely fine. Um, Mark? Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the report, Your passion is clear. <laughs> anyway, my query is, and you did touch on it very briefly, was in relation to collaboration with the, the local authorities. Um, I'm assuming we have a close relationship with them when it comes to matters such as these, and there's been, you know, we've been looking at them and advising them if they've missed anything. Very much so. We, we, we obviously have sort of worked with the local authority and we've been pulling the response together to make sure that anything they wanted to put in would work in that as well. And obviously sort of my colleagues here have sort of been negotiating and working quite closely with the local authority. So it, it is something that we do across all authority. It always has been. Yeah, Steve. Just uh, observations. Uh, uh, if you look at the map uh, on page, page 44, if I, if I was not to have seen this map and not talk about air quality or anything, I was to present you with our health map 
on the riddle of where people die younger, considerably younger, on the riddle, um, it's not a great statistic to have, but on one side of the body, you on average live 12 years less than on the other side. It would probably perfectly fit that map absolutely to, to a T. Now, there's lots of other issues around that, about unemployment levels are also higher on that side of the body. But clearly, what, one of the things that it, in Riddle's council plan is about the link between the environment and ill health um, and improving those, that statistic of living 12 years less. So, so clearly, clearly, um, you know, I've also been given the remit on, on Will Council to, to help progress the Will's Council plan, uh, and, and that's the job is environment and ill health. Uh, I've been given to, to see it. So, so clearly, this will begin to play, I think, a lot more of, in my mind as of that link between poor air quality and, and you know how long you actually live. Now, it's not the only factor that's in there, but, but quite clearly, very useful matter and, and an important reminder that air quality is something that we need to, to, to be mindful of and, and, and improve. So, so I, I welcome the report, uh, and thought we'd make that observation uh, in a fairly simplistic way. Thank you. A very good and valid observation as well, Steve. Let me, uh, I've also got John next. Thanks, Chair. I suppose in a sense it's following on from Steve's point there. If you look at page 46, there's uh, quite damning information there about the, uh, the, the levels of nitrous oxide in diesel fuel. It's four times that the pollution, 22 times, 2200 percent of major health impacts. This reflects back on obviously on Gordon's point earlier on. I'm just wondering in terms of our supply chain, our tractors, whether we can actually drive this down. It's clear, to my mind, diesel should be banned across the, the planet, let alone just across Merseyside. But clearly we could have some sort of impact here. Yeah. It's it. We've got a lot of people who are going to sell their cars, but just don't want to sleep easily tonight. Um, but clearly there's an issue here in terms of our contractual chain, our supply chain, in terms of what, what energy they actually use to fuel their particular transportation. And I'm just wondering if we can take that argument forward and say, look, these particulates in, in diesel are extremely bad to our health, extremely detrimental to our health, and I'm just wondering if we can exert some sort of pressure on those people to say, look, we need to move away from this form of fuel to more sustainable energy, clean energy, clean technology. Okay, so at that point, we take them along, we're extremely grateful uh, if colleagues agree. And secondly, I'm delighted to say that there are actually hyperlinks for this report. Uh, that's a point I've been raising on more than one occasion, and it has obviously improved our carbon footprint because it has to create a lot less pain. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks for that, John. And yeah, both points you know, it's very, very valid to understand how we can make a practical reality. Yeah. Okay, if there's no further um, further questions or comments, I can move the recommendation to paragraph two of the report. That's agreed. Excellent. Um, last up, in terms of um, AOB, the only thing I've um, got to say uh, is obviously uh, this is the last formal meeting where our Chief Executive, Dave Brown, will be our Chief Executive before he moves on to his new post of Chief Executive of Transport for the North. Now, Dave has been with us uh, for over two years now and I always thought, um, as Merseysiders and increasing Liverpool City Regioners, it was always a proud boast that we had that in David we had best in class for our transport networks. On his new uh, post, I'm sure the proud northerners uh, were pleased we've got best in class for the whole of the north's uh, transport network. I think when we think about sort of what David's achieved with us over the past couple of years, it's been really significant. And the fact that we won Transport Authority of the Year um, only last month, I uh, think he's testament to all of those. Uh, achievements. I think it's been a real pleasure and privilege for all of us to work with, work with David uh, over the past couple of years and I think we've all gained a lot and learned a lot uh, from him and I'm sure we're all delighted for him in his new posting and delighted that we'll be working with him in that new role to really transform the north of England. So can I ask you all to put your hands together and congratulate <laughs> I'm just going to say thank you very much um, to the members, really. Um, it's been an absolute uh, honour and privilege to work in the last two and a half years. Um, during the interview process for um, Transport for the North, they said, what's the one achievement you are most proud of in your career? Uh, and it's quite hard, you know, when you've done so many different things at different levels. 
And actually what I said was it's the last two years have been the, the proudest thing we've done. Because we've delivered so many things here, both um, at a northern level through Rail North, some big infrastructure schemes that are now on the ground being delivered after lots of years of development. But we've also delivered things in very short space of time that Gary was alluding to around the Walrus Card, um, but things that make a real difference to people's lives around my ticket and affordability and travel. And I think that's really come about, um, from my perspective, from really dedicated directors and staff, uh, but absolutely from um, the clear policy direction that we get from you as members. Well um, it's been really refreshing for me um, to work with a set of members that are very, very committed, uh, very dedicated, work really collaboratively with our officers, definitely challenge us robustly, uh, definitely hold us to account, but give us absolute support and clear policy direction. So thank you very much for that, and I look forward to working with you through Transport for the North.